next on 11 News. I'm Jane Miller, live at Baltimore City Hall. Fred Bielfeld, Baltimore's police commissioner, known for his candid cop speak, is leaving. That story next. Terrell Suggs suffers a major injury. What he says about a possible return for this coming season and what a doctor says about the long-term effects, that's straight ahead. Tracking thunderstorms and some summer-like temperatures headed our way. Insta Weather Plus coming up. Live, local, late-breaking. This is WBAL TV 11 News at 5. Three big stories tonight, all of them developing as we speak. A serious injury sidelines Ravens linebacker Terrell Suggs for quite possibly the entire 2012 season. What Terrell and the uh, team are saying tonight. And a beltway back up the stretch for miles. Drivers trapped for hours on 695 as a tractor trailer loaded with building materials overturns, dumping its load all over the inner loop. And calling it quits after more than 30 years on the force, five of them as the police commissioner, Fred Bielfeld is leaving the Baltimore City Police Department. Good evening, everybody. I'm Stan Stovall. And I'm Donna Hamilton. As you can tell, there is a lot going on today. We begin tonight with the departure of the city's much respected police commissioner, Fred Bielfeld. Yeah, never one uh, to be afraid to use colorful language when describing his fight to rid city streets of criminals. Today, after more than 30 years on the force, five of them as the commissioner, he told the mayor he's ready to step down. I team lead investigative report. Reporter Jane Miller is live downtown tonight with the late breaking details. Jane. Stan, the commissioner told Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake of his decision this afternoon, telling her he wants to leave the police department to spend more time with his family. Bill Feld was named commissioner by a previous mayor, Sheila Dixon, in 2007. He is credited with achieving significant drops in the city's notorious homicide numbers, and he's well known for his candid cop speak, using phrases like bad guys with guns and often referring to criminals as knuckleheads. He has also had to deal with the stains on the police department's reputation, the towing scandal last year, and currently allegations about a rogue investigation organized by a key Baltimore homicide detective. That is a still unfolding case that involves the alleged misuse of department resources. We spoke a short time ago with one of Bielfeld's colleagues, Gary McElhaney. Are you surprised? I, I am. I am surprised. I thought, um, at least externally in the crime fighting uh, category, that the police department was doing well. Administratively and internally, they had their issues, um, and it was becoming more and more difficult. But um, as far as crime fighting strategy goes, what the public sees and what the politicians tend to rely on, those numbers seem to be going in the right direction. In a statement released by her office, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake called Bielfeld a great public servant who is owed a debt of gratitude. She said she respects his decision. A national search will be done to find his replacement. August 1st is the date that Fred Bielfeld is to leave. Reporting live tonight from City Hall, I'm Jane Miller, WBAL TV 11 News. All right, Jane, thank you. Another developing story right now, the inner loop of the Beltway back open after being completely shut down for hours today in Arbutus. First reported on WBALTV.com, Sky Team 11 has been over the mess since it happened just after 1240 this afternoon near Washington Boulevard. A tractor trailer, you see it right there, overturned and lost its entire load of lumber pipes. Let's send it out to Captain Roy Taylor and Sky Team 11 right now and see what's happening at this hour. Roy? Stan, we have good news to report. The left side of your screen is the inner loop of the Beltway where that accident occurred. And as you can see, traffic is moving freely through here. Right now, it's just normal operations here on the southwest side of the Beltway. Reporting live in Sky Team 11, I'm Captain Roy Taylor. And now to news that's in shockwaves through Ravens fans, and no doubt the yep. entire team. Ravens linebacker Terrell Suggs confirms he has partially torn his Achilles tendon. Yeah, it's an injury the NFL Defensive Player of the Year insists will not keep him sidelined for the entire 2012 season. 11 Sports Pete Gilbert joins us live in the studio with more. Hey, Pete. Well, via Twitter and text message, Terrell Suggs said all the things Ravens fans want to hear about such a devastating injury except, of course, that it didn't happen. But what are the practical realities for Suggs' road to recovery, and how will he rely on his teammates to get him through? The reigning NFL Defensive Player of the Year, Terrell Suggs, seemed ready to lead the Ravens not only as they knock on the Super Bowl door, but to finally break it down. But a ruptured Achilles tendon put Suggs and his 82 career sacks on the shelf. Former Raven Kadri Ismael knows what a serious injury is like in the latter part of a career. I think the first part of it is the shock. Uh, the invincibility factor is a little lessened. 
But then there's the, okay, what do I need to do to get back? I think a lot of guys have had injuries and now you got an ability to draw upon their knowledge and understanding of how did you get back? It's not just the surgery that does it, it's the rehab that really does it. Sugg says it may only be a partial tear, but according to Achilles expert, Dr. Gregory Guyton of Union Memorial Hospital, that's highly unlikely given Sugg's age and size. Here's a probable recovery scenario. At about a year, you'll get 95% of the strength back. Now, one of the key features of Achilles is you, you probably never quite get 100%. Nobody who would really study an Achilles tendon rupture and return would expect him to approach anywhere close to the 95 to 100% of the other side that you're ultimately going to see by the end of this season. Even under the best of circumstances, sitting here in May, uh, it's unlikely that by the end of the season you're going to see that. But you could get him safe. But how effective is safe? 85% with Terrell Suggs might be better than 100% for the vast majority of the league. And so uh, uh, the odds are, could he, could he return to play? I think there is a good chance that Terrell Suggs could come back to play in the, the latter months of the season and still be a very effective player. Um, he would be beating the odds. And that's something Terrell Suggs is not afraid to do. You know, he's only missed nine or three games in his nine year career, but he'll likely miss at least twice that. So what about those tasked with picking up the slack and what are the chances of a re rupture? We'll talk about that new at six live in the studio. Pete Gilbert, WBAL TV 11 sports. All right, Pete, thank you. Meanwhile, tonight, football fans in San Diego are dealing with the loss of one of their popular sports icons. A makeshift memorial has been growing throughout the day outside of Junior Seau's restaurant in Southern California. Seau died Wednesday of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound to the chest. In his 20-season career, Seau played for the San Diego Chargers, the Miami Dolphins, and the New England Patriots. He was a 12-time Pro Bowler. And that storied career has many wondering if the hits on the field, in particular numerous concussions, may have contributed to Seau's death. Mm. Well, a split verdict tonight in the trial of two brothers accused of beating an African-American teenager while on a neighborhood watch. Tonight, one brother walks free, but another is found guilty on two charges. Our live local late-breaking coverage continues with 11 News reporter Lowell Melzer at the Mitchell Courthouse. Lowell. Yeah, Donna, a mixed bag of sorts in this case as Judge Pamela White finds the younger Avi Wertesheim not guilty of all counts in this case and the older Ellie Wertesheim guilty of false imprisonment and second degree assault and not guilty of use of a deadly weapon. Now this case, which lasted about two weeks, went on despite the victim in the case refusing to testify, and we saw Ellie take the stand in his own defense. In the end, Judge White said that she felt there was enough evidence to show that Ellie held the victim on the ground against his will after assaulting him. After the verdict, we spoke with the Wertersheim's counsel and a lawyer representing the victim's family. Well, I'm relieved that Avi was acquitted of all charges. Needless to say, we're devastated over um, Ellie's results and we're very hopeful that um, justice will, will tri uh, triumph in the end for Ellie. Ellie Wertesheim is very upset right now. He's disappointed um, and uh, I'm disappointed uh, in the verdict. I think that the social issues that were raised by this case are are important regardless of the court finding. When I went home yesterday and thought about all the evidence that had come out during the trial, uh, I assumed that this would be the verdict. And uh, so we're, we're quite pleased with it. And the victim's family attorney also tells 11 News that the family has dropped its civil case against the Wertersheims. Sentencing for Ellie Wertersheim is, is uh, scheduled for June 27th at 1 p.m. We'll have more details on what exactly unfolded in court today tonight at 6 o'clock. For now, we're live outside the Mitchell Courthouse. I'm Lowell Melser, WBAL TV 11 News. Lowell, thanks. And the latest on the trial for longtime political consultant Julius Hinson. The state has rested its case, claiming that Hinson tried to suppress the black vote in the 2010 gubernatorial election using robocalls. At this hour, the defense is laying out its arguments. One of them, the political definition of suppression, is different from the legal one. Henson may take the stand tomorrow. And we go now to breaking news out of Baltimore County. You're looking at video just into our newsroom from Sky Team 11 above the scene of a school bus accident in Owings Mills. And police say four people, including one student, were hurt when the bus and another vehicle collided near Deer Park Elementary. We're told all those injuries are not life threatening. The victims are being treated at Northwest Hospital.
Well, across the state, a sharp uh, contrast in temperatures. East winds coming in off the ocean, keeping coastal areas much, much cooler than areas uh, to the west of us. Around the coastal areas of Delaware off the bay there, temperatures in the mid-60s, all the way up into northern Delaware, the upper uh, sections of Maryland near the Pennsylvania line, low 70s around Baltimore. But as you head west, the temperatures steadily warm into the 80s as you get back toward Hagerstown. And even warmer than that in some spots in western Maryland, we've seen temperatures around Cumberland approaching 90, 80s well out into western Maryland. Maryland and uh, very warm down into parts of Northern Virginia as well. So in that warm air, as you can see, there are some scattered thunderstorms popping up this evening, and those storms are going to be drifting to the south and east, possibly reaching Baltimore. A better chance for some storms, uh, a few strong ones in our area tomorrow as some summer like air moves our way. Insta Weather Plus details in a couple of minutes. All right, Tom, thank you. We have a reminder for you tonight. You might want to avoid the JFX if you're hitting the roads overnight. As 11 News told you all this week, there are more emergency closures going into effect starting tonight at 10 o'clock. In about five hours from now, all northbound lanes will be detoured at the North Avenue 28th Street exit. You'll eventually end up back on I-83. The overnight closures will stay in place until Monday. Now, as for as far as the single left lane closures in both directions near 28th Street, those will stay until construction is complete, which will take about six to eight weeks. And the Sears at the Columbia Mall will be shut down for some time as officials investigate an early morning fire in a nearby trailer. Employees at the department store arrived to work to find a hectic scene at the mall. Firefighters extinguishing flames and crews on hand working to clean up the damage. We're told that the, bra the blaze broke out just before 6 this morning near the loading dock, but the bigger problem for the store was all that smoke. There's a significant smoke damage on the first and second floor of the Sears. Along with firefighters, officials with the health department are on scene to assess the smoke's impact on the food court. The rest of the mall will remain open. Crews tell us no injuries have been reported. No word yet on what sparked that fire either. Still ahead tonight, you've likely heard the frantic 911 calls. The, uh, got the baby. The baby have a nice hour. Workers at the Department of Social Services desperately calling for help as an infant is stabbed inside their facility. And when we come back, Governor O'Malley is using the cautionary tale to fight budget cuts. I'm Rob Roblin, honoring our fallen heroes. That story coming up. I need, I need to add more city to the center at 3031 Federal. Hey, 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 Boy, that's just a portion of one of the chilling 911 calls released earlier this week as workers at the Baltimore Department of Social Services desperately try to save an infant who they say had been stabbed in their facility by her own mother during a supervised visit. Tonight, state and city officials are saying thank you. And it was all the surprise. Governor Martin O'Malley and Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake were among those on hand this morning, thanking William Short III and Dana Hayes for jumping to action. Police say uh, Kenesha Thomas stabbed her eight month old daughter while visiting her at the office on East Middle Street. The governor used this situation to show just how important it is to maintain state and federal funding for health and social service departments. There are hundreds of these sorts of visitations that go on on a regular uh, basis. Uh, I think, uh, and in this case, the, the workers reacted very quickly and very courageously. Now, since the incident, officials at DSS have been reevaluating their security practices, and while they say they plan to retain the services of a private firm, a number of changes will be instituted to prevent something like this from happening again. In tonight's medical alert, a new study finds that children born too early or too late may face more problems. Researchers in the Netherlands followed over 5,000 babies for three years after their birth. They found both preterm and children born at least two weeks late had more behavioral and emotional problems than their peers. In fact, postterm children were more likely to twice as likely to have clinically diagnosed ADHD by the age of 18 and 36 months, but they don't really know why. Well, a baby's first bath is a big deal, usually kind of traumatizing to the parents, but sometimes baths can cause tiny newborns to lose too much body heat. It started with a growth concern for late preterm babies who look and mostly act like full-term newborns but are born just a few weeks early. 
Late preterm infants don't have as much body fat as full-term babies, so when they get chilly, they have to use all of their resources to warm up. Nurses in one Boston studied 100 babies and found that babies who had a warm tub bath stayed warmer than those who were sponge bathed. If the baby is trying very hard to stay warm, then it doesn't have the energy to feed well. And everybody knows a baby has to eat well or else, you know, you're going to have problems. And those problems include low blood sugar, weight loss, and jaundice. Well, four months ago, the U.S. government sought to block publication of two studies about how scientists created an easily spread form of bird flu. Officials were worried that the full papers would give bioterrorists a blueprint for creating weapons. Well, a revised version of one of them is seeing the light of day now. Most human avian flu cases have been acquired through close contact with birds. But researchers now have created a virus in the lab that they say is capable of being transmitted from human to human with just four mutations. Researchers hope this can help scientists understand what makes bird flu spread in people. Now, your 11 Inch to Weather Plus forecast with Chief Meteorologist Tom Tasselmeyer. Good weather for the evening commute around the Baltimore Beltway. No sign of any uh, big storms or showers uh, moving through our area in the next uh, few minutes at least. It's a clean sweep on HD Doppler uh, from Towson down to Elkridge and to Glen Burnie and over onto the eastern shore. Not too far to our west, however, there are some thunderstorms developing. These are pretty much up in the mountains and in some much warmer air that has been uh, enveloped across much of western Maryland from Hagerstown back into the mountains, 85 to 90 degrees for a good part of the afternoon. So a much warmer atmosphere out there leading to the round of thunderstorms that are showing some eastward drift, although it doesn't look like the bulk of that activity will survive the evening hours and the more stable air in the central and eastern part of the state. But it's worth watching, especially as we get to for folks over there in parts of western Frederick County, maybe ca catching Carroll County in the next couple of hours, but it does look like they're mostly up in the mountains and in the warmer air. Uh, if you check out the, what happened around here today, we'll see that the pollen count is a lot lower because there were some late night showers and storms, especially across the northern tier and the northern suburbs had a big round of big boomers and thunderstorms. And those early morning showers helped to keep the morning pollen count down. Again, the pollen is counted early in the morning. 53 the total count. There was some weed pollen showing up though today. That may be the sign of the next phase of pollen and allergies that we'll have to deal with the weed pollen. Temperatures, look at that, out in Petersburg, West Virginia right now, 90 degrees, 85 in Romney, 82 in Hancock, Hagerstown, 84, Frederick, almost 90 degrees. Contrast that to 59 on the coast at Ocean City. It all depends on which direction the wind is blowing. Over here, the winds are coming in off the chilly ocean. That uh, cool east breeze makes it all the way back to the just about the western shore of the bay. And then as you get up into the mountains, you get into the much warmer air. Southwesterly winds here are bringing some heat into western Maryland as close as Frederick and Carroll counties. And again, it's in that warmer air. You have the best chance for a shower or a storm tonight. Other areas will just see that low cloud and fog uh, reforming late tonight into Friday morning. So uh, after a little bit of the late day sunshine, the clouds are going to come back. There could be an isolated thunderstorm, especially west of town. Lows tonight. 59 to 66. Look at the warmth here. It really shows up when you look at the broad scale. 50 in Boston now, 59 down at Ocean City, 57 in New York, then 70s, 80s, and again, close to 90 in many locations. Detroit, Michigan right now at 89 degrees. That's going to come surging in here tomorrow. More and more of the Mid-Atlantic will get into the warm sector of this storm as the warm front gets pushed up toward New England. And so the muggy air and the hot uh, kind of summery air that we see over here will be with us for the day tomorrow. And that means a better chance for storms as this front is moving down into that warm muggy air. In fact, there are severe thunderstorm watches covering the Southern Lakes right now. And tomorrow, the Severe Storms Prediction Center thinks there could be some strong to severe storms in the Mid-Atlantic, as well as the Western Ohio Valley and back into the Plain States. Insta Weather Plus Futurecast shows the storms popping here tomorrow afternoon after some morning clouds and fog. It heats up. We catch a shower or a storm. Saturday morning, there may be a few lingering showers up until about 10 or 11, but then it should clear out. And after those early morning showers on Saturday, the rest of the weekend is looking pretty nice, especially Sunday. Sunny skies and a more comfortable temperature. 84 to 89 to finish the work week on Friday. Afternoon thunderstorms and west winds at 5 to 10. On the bay, a south breeze averaging about 5 knots today will begin to shift to the west tomorrow and still continue at about 5 to 10 knots. Insta weather plus 7 days. Storms tomorrow evening. And then as we head into the weekend, a shower is possible Saturday morning before it clears up and turns a whole lot more comfortable on Sunday. High temperatures around 75.
All right, Tom, thank you. See you in a bit. Well, we're now getting a chance to read some of Osama bin Laden's inner thoughts while he was in hiding in Pakistan. And some new documents being released online today by the U.S. Army's Combating Terrorism Center. Some stunning revelations about what was found inside the terrorist leader's compound. A closer look when we come back. Plus... In just this last school year alone, Chesapeake High School has lost three students to traffic crashes. And with prom season and summer just around the corner, they're trying to give kids a message that won't just go through one ear and out the other. I'm Jennifer Franciati. Details are next. The Combating Terrorism Center at West Point has released declassified letters and documents found at Osama bin Laden's compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. And those papers show, at, well, pretty much give scholars and others an insight into the workings of Al-Qaeda. At least that's what they're hoping. 11 News reporter Michelle Franzen has more on the letters from Abbottabad. The compound in Pakistan where Osama bin Laden lived in secrecy and died after U.S. Special Forces tracked him down is gone, destroyed without a trace. But documents, letters, and other evidence seized the night of the raid left a trail showing the al-Qaeda leader still had aspirations to attack the U.S. As a former professional intelligence officer, there's nothing I would like to have more than the capacity to read my enemy's mail. And in this case, we're actually reading 10 years of Osama bin Laden's mail. The intelligence community and the public are getting a snapshot look at some of the documents analyzed over the past year at West Point's Combating Terrorism Center. The West Wing gave West Point the green light to publish 17 documents and letters on its website, originals written in Arabic and translated into English, dated from 2006 to April 2011. Because of the renewed interest in uh, on this anniversary in the mission that uh, led to bin Laden's demise, uh, that this was deemed an appropriate time to release them. Terrorism experts say it shows bin Laden focused on grand plots following 9-11, including an outline to assassinate President Obama and then NATO commander General David Petraeus. There's no question of his aspiration here. He wanted to kill the President of the United States. The documents also exposed cracks within the terrorist organization worldwide. This shows an organization in decline, under siege and really feeling the pressure. The threat of al-Qaeda diminished with bin Laden's death, experts say, but not gone. Michelle Franzen, WBAL TV 11 News. In tonight's Commitment 2012 update, Congresswoman and former presidential candidate Michelle Bachman endorses Mitt Romney, a decision which could carry a lot of weight with two groups of voters that Romney needs behind him. Bachman was a powerful voice for the Tea Party and Republican women, and today, as she spoke in Virginia, to endorse Romney, what women decide could determine who wins the election. And polls show Romney trails the president right now with those voters. Now what Mitt Romney has going for him is the deep and broad antipathy to Barack Obama on the right among conservative women and among Tea Party types. He can capitalize that to compensate for his own shortcomings in appealing to them. Another issue for Romney, choosing his running mate. Romney could pick one to specifically help him with the conservative Tea Party or with moderate independent women. Uh, decisions, decisions. Oh, yeah. Well, for the 27th year in a row, thousands will remember the fallen heroes of Maryland. Yeah, but this year may be particularly somber for residents of Howard County, how a father of six and an 11-year state police veteran will be honored. Plus... I'm Tim Toon. Baltimore County is looking to hire more teachers, but how many? The numbers may surprise you. Plus, be the district's new teacher of the year. Those stories straight ahead. Live, local, late breaking. You're watching WBAL TV 11 News at 5 in HD with Stan Stovall, Donna Hamilton. Your Insta Weather Plus forecast with Chief Meteorologist Tom Tesselmeyer. 11 News at 5 at HD continues now. In Howard County today, police officers who paid the ultimate price were honored. They're all fallen heroes. Over the years, seven officers in Howard County have lost their lives in the line of duty. And it was almost a year ago when Maryland State Trooper Shaft Hunter was killed. And today, his name was added to the list of fallen heroes. 11 News reporter Rob Roblin has the story.
Today in Howard County, they honored the police officers who lost their lives in the line of duty and their families. To the families and friends of these brave individuals, I offer in the name of all those who gathered here our condolences, our sympathy, and our love. Almost a year after his death, State Trooper Shaft Hunter was honored. A plaque was unveiled in the Memorial Garden, and his family placed flowers to honor him. It means memory, remembering um, our son who made the ultra, ultimate sacrifice, as well as remembering all of those who have fallen and have given their all. Howard County Police Officer Corporal Scott Wheeler lost his life in 2007. While the family says the ceremony means a lot, it is still painful. They let you know that people don't forget that they still remember him, but it's hard. <laughs> We miss him every day. I come every year because it just shows that Ted's sacrifice and the sacrifice of all the other officers, and the ones still in law enforcement, it's all remembered and it means something. Over the years, seven police officers have lost their lives in Howard County in the line of duty. It's for those left behind that this ceremony is held every year. Losing one of our own is always very tough and the fact that Howard County would be out here today to recognize the trooper that, that died in their county means the world to the state police. People make promises not to forget. Well, we try not to, to, to go back on that promise, and um, it's important that we come out here every year and, and honor those people. They, they made the ultimate sacrifice, honor their families, and really to celebrate those of us that are still left doing the job. Tomorrow there will be a Fallen Heroes Day ceremony at Delaney Valley Memorial Gardens, honoring all of Maryland's police officers and firefighters who died in the line of duty. Rob Roblin, WBAL-TV, 11 News. Breaking news right now. Let's send it out to Captain Roy Taylor and Sky Team 11. Roy, what do we see here? Uh, people tried to go home on 295, just south of I-95, a single vehicle crash here on the BW Parkway, shut down two lanes, and as you can see, the traffic is backing up rapidly towards the Inner Harbor. Reporting live in Sky Team 11, I'm Captain Roy Taylor. All right, Roy, thank you. Well, here's a look at some of our other top stories at this hour. After 31 years as a member of the Baltimore Police Department and five years as commissioner, Fred Bielfeld is stepping down. Bielfeld, who began his career as a Baltimore police cadet back in 1981, says he wants to spend more time with his family. His retirement is effective August 1st of this year, but Bielfeld has agreed to work on a transition plan during the next several weeks. A national search for the commissioner's replacement will begin immediately. And upsetting news for Ravens fans and players tonight. Terrell Suggs has partially torn his Achilles tendon. Now a torn Achilles tendon usually requires a lengthy rehab, but the star linebacker insists the injury will not keep him sidelined for the entire season. Suggs, is, he was injured in Arizona while he was practicing for an upcoming conditioning test. Suggs initially thought it was just a sprain, but he says the doctor determined that it was indeed a partial tear. He's expected to have surgery possibly as soon as next week. And the inner loop of the Beltway has now reopened after being completely shut down for hours in Arbutus earlier today. Sky Team 11 was over the scene just after 1240 this afternoon near Washington Boulevard. We're told a tractor trailer overturned and lost its entire load of lumber and pipes, creating quite a mess for commuters. Luckily, no one was injured. Crews had the lanes back up and running shortly before 330, just in time for rush hour. In tonight's education alert, there's a growing number of school teachers who are deciding to stay on the job longer, especially in Baltimore County. So how will that impact those who decide to stay around? 11 News education reporter Tim Tootin joins us live in the studio with more on the story. Tim? Well, Stan, a weak economy is forcing more and more teachers to put off retirement, but those no guarantee that those who stay put will keep their same jobs at the same schools. The last day of school is more than a month away for students and teachers in Baltimore County. Some of those teachers are trying to make plans for next year, even if it means being transferred to a new building. And that appears to be causing frustration within the ranks. Not knowing where you're going to be in the next school year is really... Uh, Teachers like to be organized and they want to be ready to go. So it's very difficult for them. But uh, we are really working with the school system to try and make sure that everyone's placed as soon as we can. To add to that frustration is these numbers. They show that Baltimore County is hiring fewer teachers. Just 341 last school year, tumbling from a high of almost 1,000 five years ago. 
Top administrators say they're not surprised and say it's become a sign of the times. As schools enrollment shift up or shift down, we either have to add teachers or we have to move some teachers. The key point is everybody has a job and they have no less of a job than what they had before. Some parent groups say now may be the best time to lobby for school-based changes. I feel it's very important for the parents to continue having that open dialogue with their principals and administrators to understand how budget constraints are impacting their school. School officials say that also goes for teachers hoping to plan their future in the classroom. Now right now, Baltimore County has about 400 teacher openings. In other education news, Baltimore County has a new Teacher of the Year. She was named this morning. She's Angela Roundtree, an art teacher and chair of the art department at Ridgely Middle School in Lutherville. The 22-year educator was picked from a half a dozen other finalists. A surprise announcement came during a special ceremony at school board headquarters. I'm very proud to be part of this great school system and there are very many things that I'm passionate about and I look forward to the experience of being able to spread the word about those things, about multicultural education and about service learning. Angela Roundtree was honored with a number of gifts including a computer, a year-long membership to a popular fitness center and her own special parking space. As Baltimore County's Teacher of the Year, she gets to compete for Maryland State Teacher of the Year. Live in the studio, Tim Tootin, WBAL TV 11 News. Oh, that's nice, Tim. The only, par the only parking space, that's golden there, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tim. Well, a New Jersey mother who is clearly an extreme tanner herself, accused of allowing her fair-skinned, red-haired daughter into a tanning bed, causing some serious burns. Yeah, we've already heard her side of the story. Well, coming up, you're gonna hear what her husband has to say about those child endangerment charges against his wife. In just this last school year alone, Chesapeake High School has lost three students to traffic crashes. And with prom season and summer just around the corner, they're trying to give kids a message that won't just go through one ear and out the other. I'm Jennifer Franciati. Details are next. Covering the nation tonight, police in a Phoenix suburb believe a former Marine with ties to neo-Nazi and Minuteman groups shot and killed four people before taking his own life. A police spokesman in Gilbert says investigators believe that Jason Reddy was the gunman in yesterday's shootings. According to reports, the four others who were killed include his girlfriend, her daughter and granddaughter. Investigators believe the shooting was the result of a domestic situation. And a, a diplomatic crisis is escalating over one of China's best known human rights activists. The latest Chen Gong Cheng is now telling the United States he wants to leave China and seek asylum in the U.S. And that is deepening that diplomatic dispute. The blind self-taught lawyer spent six days in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing after escaping from house arrest. He was then brought to the hospital by the U.S. ambassador after an apparent deal between U.S. and China. The case itself has caused a strain on the relations between the two countries, casting a shadow over Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's pre-scheduled visit to China this week. Well, tonight, the husband of a New Jersey mom accused of allowing her six-year-old daughter to tan in a tanning salon is speaking out in defense of his wife. Patricia Krenzel pled not guilty yesterday to charges of child endangerment. And Krenzel says she tans frequently, but says she would never allow her fair-skinned, red-haired daughter to do the same. School administrators alerted police when the girl showed up to class with a sunburn and told the school nurse she got it, quote, tanning with mommy. Well, now her husband, uh, Rich, is insisting his wife is a good mother who's been wrongly accused and unfairly judged. Joy's tanning, and I just think that, you know, that's what that's like a sort of a, a thing that she does. But I think, yeah, I, I agree she's being judged way, this is being judged uh, right away when the real, the real truth will come out. Well, Krenzel, seen here with the deep, dark tan, remains free on bond and is scheduled to make her next court appearance on June 4th. I mean, when you look at her, it's just the oddest oh, appearance, man. isn't it? Yeah. Does she see the same thing we I, see? I don't know. Clearly yeah, not. Okay. Well, buying a home may never get any cheaper than right now. Several housing experts are predicting that this year will be the last chance for bargain hunters to cash in on the best deals of the weak housing market. Details in our Consumer Alert. And imagine waking up, looking outside your window and seeing this outside. What caused this massive sinkhole to pop up in a Florida couple's backyard? Wow. 
Some thunderstorms on HD Doppler, mostly to our west, but kind of drifting in this direction toward the Baltimore area. We'll keep an eye on them. But right now, the view from Sky Team 11 is pretty nice. A little sunshine, 76 down at the airport and 74 at the Inner Harbor. And Anne Arundel County High School, plagued with crash-related student deaths, is hoping a real-life story of survival will make a difference. 11 News reporter Jennifer Franciotti has more in our 3D Project Report. In the last 10 years, Chesapeake High School has lost 10 students to traffic crashes, three in this school year alone, and now school officials are trying to give students a wake-up call. You know my favorite part about this picture? My right leg. It's gorgeous, isn't it? It's muscular, my foot's up like that, because now it's paralyzed. Tyler Presnell knows more than most about making bad decisions in a car. That's why he was brought into Chesapeake High School to get real with students. The 27-year-old from Oregon was 14 when he took the brunt of a 70-mile-per-hour crash. He'd ridden unbuckled with a new driver on a ride home. And in between our two homes, he just started putting his chest out, trying to show off, and, and uh, was doing about 80, lost control, and, and I took the entire brunt of it. He slid into a telephone pole. Tyler was in a coma for six weeks, and now 22 surgeries later, he talks with teens all over the country about the very real consequences of unsafe choices, and his message is clear. Wear their seatbelt, respect their life, and respect their friends' lives. Respect their family, respect their loved ones. That's what it's all about. May is National Youth Traffic Safety Month, and experts say teens are at risk, especially during the summer months, which are considered the deadliest time for young drivers. We keep doing these events. We do them throughout May. We actually do them throughout the year. Uh, the more they hear the message, the better, because kids tend to have a short memory. Our community has been affected a lot by accidents on Mountain Road, so I really hope this hits home for our school. The accidents are horrific. We're losing life um, down to um, drinking and driving, texting, speed. I really hope that they um, recognize the dangers of decision making, not just on those who are driving behind the wheel, but also being safe passengers in a car. Most people listen to their parents and just ignore them. And they're like, all right, whatever mom, whatever dad, whatever. But having someone younger, someone almost their age who had a horrible life experience, I think it, they'll take more away from the situation. And talk about a timely message. Just this morning, two students were told were involved in two separate accidents on their way to Chesapeake High School. We're told they're both expected to be okay. In Pasadena, Jennifer Franciati, WBAL-TV 11 News. Now, your 11 Inch to Weather Plus forecast with Chief Meteorologist Tom Tasselmeyer. For the immediate Baltimore City area and around the Beltway, looks like the dry weather continues through the evening rush hour to the west of us up into the mountains where temperatures have actually been uh, quite a bit warmer, 85 to 90 degrees in western Maryland this afternoon. That's where we see some strong thunderstorms rolling in. They've been drifting out of western uh, Maryland and the western Pennsylvania mountains and now working their way just south of Hagerstown, one batch and another batch up in parts of Pennsylvania. Uh, 90 degree temperature this past hour at Petersburg, West Virginia in the panhandle there. 88 degrees in Frederick at this hour, so very muggy off to the west of us, and that's what those storms are feeding on. They're going to drift east, slowly weaken overnight. Can't roll out a shower passing through some of the Baltimore metro area. Looks like it'll pretty much fall apart before it hits the eastern shore. And late tonight, we'll see some of the clouds and fog reforming. A mild night, lows from 59 to 66. The heat to our west goes all the way up to Detroit and Chicago, upper 80s there, 83 in Cincinnati right now, 88 in Charleston, West Virginia, Pittsburgh, 86 degrees. That warm front, which is dividing the cooler temperatures around Baltimore and the coastal areas from the summer heat over the Ohio Valley and the lakes, that front continues to make its way slowly up toward New England, so tomorrow we will see temperatures here climbing, and that leads to a, a potential for stronger severe thunderstorms. The Severe Storms Prediction Center has us in the slight risk, a slight risk for severe storms tomorrow afternoon. So warm and muggy afternoon storms tomorrow, showers tomorrow night, but it looks like that activity is going to get south of us Saturday early in the morning, which leaves the bulk of the weekend looking pretty nice. We should get at least some sunshine in here, if not a good deal of it on Saturday and Sunday looks beautiful. 84 to 89 tomorrow, warm and muggy day, afternoon thunderstorms. So if you're going out on the bay, keep an eye on the sky. You could have some thunderstorms rolling your way tomorrow afternoon. The Insta Weather Plus 7 day temperatures still in the 80s as the winds shift on Saturday and maybe a shower in the morning. Then sunshine Saturday afternoon, beautiful looking Sunday, partly cloudy and 73 on Monday.
Well, in tonight's Consumer Alert, there's now more incentive than ever for Americans to buy or refinance a home. Average rates for 30-year and 15-year fixed mortgages are now at fresh record lows. In fact, mortgage buyer Freddie Mac says the rate on the 30-year fixed loan fell to 3.84 percent, the lowest it's been since long-term mortgages began back in the 1950s. The 15-year mortgage, which is a popular option for refinancing, dropped to 3.07 percent, also a new record. Mortgage rates as a whole have been below 5% for the past year, yet home sales have slumped and remain well below healthy levels. While consumers may soon be paying more to enjoy red meat, as several factors are contributing to the skyrocketing price of beef, according to the U.S. Agriculture Department's Economic Research Service, some cuts of beef have gone up more than 30% because of high demand and also a jump in fuel and feed cost. And while the cost of living has gone up in the past, butchers say the current trend is something new. For, for years, fuel prices and, and the cost of doing business have gone up on our end, and our cattle prices have stayed um, you know, relatively the same or, or even lower. Butchers say it's costing them at least a cent or two more every time they get an order, and with an increase in demand, that's about four or five times a week. Something else you're going to be paying more for, taking a carry-on bag aboard a Spirit Airlines flight. The airline has announced it's upping that charge to $100. That's up from the current charge of $45 a bag. Now, this fee is for customers who pay at the boarding gate. If, but if you're paying at the airport counter or a kiosk, you'll still be paying that original $45 charge. The new fees will go into effect on November 6th. Donna? Wow, that's a lot. Well, imagine waking up, looking outside your window and seeing this in your backyard. A couple in Windermere, Florida have been forced out of their home after a 100-foot diameter sinkhole opened up. Officials declared the home unsafe uh, after the enormous 50 foot deep hole opened just a few feet away from the home's rear sliding glass doors. Nearby homeowners were also notified about the risk that it could grow closer to their homes and it's already devoured four trees. Emergency personnel are now helping the homeowners move their belongings out of that home. Amazing. Well, a doomsday budget has cast a dark shadow over education and public safety all over Maryland. But one economist says the state would have three times the amount of money to spend if we made one big change. Change. Details on that coming up new at 6. I'm Sarah Caldwell. You've heard of traditional yoga and hot yoga, but how about aerial yoga? We're going to teach you how to fly next. You know, many of us dream of flying. I know I have, but a new trend in yoga makes you feel like you actually are. Resident yogi Sarah Caldwell put gravity to the test as she tried out aerial yoga for the first time. So let's take the fabric under your hip bones and walk yourself forward. You've no and doubt seen them separately, but the combination the of aerial dance Keeping and traditional yoga in. is quickly Here. catching on. Take Born from the vision right of aerial dance off. instructor Jane Bernasconi. When I was teaching aerial dance to some of my beginner students, some of them would get anxieties when they would take their feet off the ground. Sure. So Jane okay. put more emphasis on the principles yes. of well, yoga to you, help them. She to adapted the postures so they'd work suspended from the aerial the fabric. A beautiful blend of yoga and dance, further, prompting many yogis to convert. Right hand I just might be one of them. I joined the group made up of all shoulders. ages and levels of experience. It's only been a few weeks for Seth Ramesh, but he so says his flexibility and state of mind have already improved. You get rid of all your stress from the day, and I even stopped going to my regular yoga class because you get that benefit here. Extend your legs straight. Another plus, less pressure on the spine. Francis right Tut loves the way aerial the yoga elongates. It's different in that it's non-compression, so you get to do different moves. As you begin to rise your legs up, as we're breathing, then we move slowly. You're getting the same stretching, but you can actually go deeper into some of the stretches because you're using gravity in a different way. For many, it's the closest they'll ever come to actually flying. And once you've reached a level of comfort, the sky's the limit. You need to trust that the fabric is gonna support you and that you're gonna um, explore something new and different. So you wanna make sure that your hands are... Who knows, it could make you approach life from a totally different angle. Sarah Caldwell, WBAL, TV 11 News. And Sarah says Janie Bernasconi will also offer training for certified yoga instructors who want to teach aerial yoga next month. For more on that, just go to our website, WBALTV.com. That's all for us at 5 o'clock. Here's a look at what's coming up new at 6. 
I'm Jane Miller, live at City Hall. Baltimore is now on the market to fill one of its most high-profile jobs. Police Commissioner, the departure of Fred Bielfeld, next. And a mixed verdict in the Park Heights Neighborhood Watch Assault case. I'm Lowell Melser. I'll have a live report. An economist takes issue with the way Maryland balances its books. She calls the current system a flawed and erratic experiment. And you'll hear from her, new at 6.